Nigel is a regenerative cropping farmer who loves a challenge. Um, he's got wheat and barley crops, and they're a great example of his farming work. He regularly wins awards and beating other conventional crops. He's motivated by a challenge, uh, particularly if someone says it can't be done, he then loves to go out and uh, prove them wrong. Now Nigel, along with John O'Fru and um, Simon Osborne, uh, and they'll all be here today, are an integral part of the Canterbury Race Group Quorum Sense. Now that's on Facebook. If you're not a member, go and join it now. I'm a member, it's really, really interesting. Now their mission is to generate and share practical knowledge to support regenerative farming systems in vibrant rural communities. It's about finding out what works and sharing the information. So open source, which is all good stuff. Right, good morning everyone. Um, yeah, so Nigel Greenwood is my name. Uh, my farm in Southbridge, which is about 20 minutes that way. Um, I've, uh, yeah, so I'm um, working with my parents on my family farm, plus I lease the ground as well. Um, I started, started my farming as a carpet farmer back as a kid, uh, cultivating my parents' lounge. Harvesting, harvesting the carpet. Um, I, after school, I went away and did an engineering apprenticeship and then came back to the farm where I'm helping still do what I'm doing. I started growing fresh market carrots, um, which, yeah, it was a, a lot of fun. Um, learned a lot. I uh, just found event after the earthquake, so I couldn't make any money out of it. So, just a cropping farmer now. Um, yeah, looking at a, a different way of doing things. Um, just everything that I had in my mind about talking about today, I was sort of a bit worried when I started listening to the discussion about glyphosate this morning. Um, I do use glyphosate as Simon uses glyphosate. I buffer it, I use it as a tool. Um, I actually would really, really love to get rid of it out of the system. I do also think there's a lot of other nastier chemicals out there, but that's probably my only contention. Um, I've, yeah, so this, I have actually done some experiments this year trying to find alternatives to glyphosate. Um, sulfate of ammonia, which is probably, yeah, I don't know, it's quite a nasty, nasty word in organic terms probably as well. But I've found that timing and application can actually do a similar job to glyphosate. Um, sorry, the slides rolling behind me are just shots I've taken. I'm not actually talking to them. I'm not that technically savvy. <laughs> <laughs> um, sorry, yeah. So for me, regenerative farming is probably the best of both worlds. Oh no, it's a it's a combination of both worlds. Um, for me. When I was growing carrots, I always looked to the organic growers to see what I could do to improve my conventional system. A um, couple of years in, I got sick from organic phosphate poisoning, and from then on in, I had a dead set mindset that I was getting rid of organic phosphates out of my system, and I dropped them very fast. Um, human health, yeah, for me, if getting sick from an organic phosphate, there's not a lot of coming back from that. Um, the levels in my body are probably high and so I didn't want to increase that. So I turned to, uh, I did a lot of research and a lot of experiments with essential oils and I found that I could actually replace a lot of chemical insecticides with essential oils, um, which is a lot of fun. Um, your neighbours see you out spraying and they think you're actually doing, yeah. What does say? Um, so yeah, you, you can actually make the uh, make things smell quite nice, but yeah, bugs hate it. Um, peppermint oil is a big one, um, as an aphicide. What was that say? Peppermint oil. Um, you don't need a lot of it. It's quite effective. Um, so yeah, so I have, I've applied one chemical insecticide in seven years on my property and I yeah, find I don't actually need them. Plant health is the key driver to basically yeah, 
keeping bugs out of crops. Um, sorry, I've lost my way now. Yes, right, yeah. Um, so I grow, I grow spray-free wheat uh, for the farmers Mill and Tamaru who have a uh, flower, pioneer flower. Um, it's a fun crop to grow, um, probably from the from the perspective that most people say you can't grow wheat um, spray free. So um, you'll see some pictures of it actually rolling behind me. I companion plant it with Vesalia. Um, helps get the get the beneficial bugs into the crop, keep it clean. I am allowed to use chemical fertilizers, but I keep them in as, as a minimum. Um, disease wise, the Conventional wheat growers use um, use a, a hell of a lot of fungicides really to keep keep the crops clean. Um, I've actually found this year with doing an experiment in a barley paddock that it's possibly the herbicides that are actually making the wheat sick to get, allow the the fungal diseases in. So I'm still still working on that one. But nutrition wise, if the plant is healthy, it's not getting sick. And I'm doing so when I plant a, when I plant a spray-free wheat crop, I'm allowed to use glyphosate pre-plant, which I do. I bowl out my cover crop. Um, the seed is sown with trichoderma, uh, so it's, you are actually allowed to plant treated seed in, a, in this contract. I chose beer seed and use trichoderma, um, so the plant is healthy right from the get-go. The yeah. So is that the treatment of the seed? Uh, it's a trichoderma is a, a fungal powder. That's a fungi. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's a fungi. And it's uh, I buy it as a as a product and I I plant two hundred grams per head. So it's, you're not using a lot. Um, it aids the soil's interaction with the plant. And yeah, that's my understanding of it. Mm. So it's treatment of the seed? No, well, it's, it's a product I'm planting with the seed, so it's not actually treatment of the seed. Yeah. Where do you plant uh, Where do I get it from? Um, I did a, I did a trial this year with some uh, a micro, a, it was a trichoderma mix with mycorrhiza, but I think it was actually a mycorrhiza food, not a mycorrhiza inoculum, and it was yeah it actually worked really well, but in the long run it was actually very similar to the trichoderma only, so yeah, um, so when the when the crops are small. I'm actually leaf testing. Um, plant nutrition is the key, I feel, to, to the plant health. So making sure the levels are, the, the yeah, plant's levels of uh, their micronutrients are where they need to be. Um, and applying, fol oh, usually I'm, I'm just applying foliars uh, to to correct those. Hmm. I feel like I'm rambling and jumbled. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, so the cover crops. Uh, I've been. I played this. Hit a play this year with some trials. And I've left. I've grazed some. I've grazed and recovered, and I have left them ungrazed and I've actually found the ungrazed cover crops uh, to be the best long term but nitrogen nitrogen um, for that early planting is probably the key because the cover crop digestion is borrowing the nitrogen from that crop so you're actually I think the following crop has actually suffered a bit so I need I need to be a bit with I need to be a bit more aggressive with the nitrogen application early on, um, which is probably, yeah, 
which has actually plagued my yields this year a wee bit, um, which has been a bit disheartening. But yeah, going forward, I think possibly terminating the cover crop a lot earlier. I was actually terminating the cover crop the day before I was planting. So if I think if I terminate the cover crop before, a lot longer before I plant, maybe three or four weeks, that might actually get rid of that nitrogen dip. Um, so yeah, so this photo here, I actually won an award with my spray free week at the Ellsmere AMP show a few years ago. Um, it was judged just in the, in the week's samples. <laughs> no one knew it was spray free until the finish. And it got the premier, premier um, sample as well, which was actually quite a hoot, and it was had spray free written on it afterwards. And I got a lot, of, a lot of questions asked after that, how you can actually grow wheat spray free, and it all comes back to nutrition. Um, at the, in the long run, my goal is growing a successful crop to feed a healthy nation. At the end of the day, if, if that crop is disease free, I technically think that if I'm eating it, I should be disease free too. That's the long term goal. Um, I've, I, haven't, I have a, a neighbour, an organic farmer, well he's an ex, the farm's sold now, but he was organic, and he was organic by neglect. And I don't see that as a, as a future, and I think that actually does disservice to, to an organisation. I have another neighbour who is very proactive organic, and he does very, very well with it. Um, I would like to find a balance between regenerative and organic. I think we could actually work together. In the long run, I think for regenerative to be successful and go chemical free, I think it comes back to if we can actually get a, a market for our crops or our produce that is worth what it is worth, not what we are offered for it, I think that's where everything will actually, will, yeah, it'd be a lot easier for me to do a lot of experiments to drop chemicals out of my system if I was actually paid a bit more for the produce that I was getting at the finish. But I guess there's pioneers in industries and I, Guess with the Quorum Sense Group, we are all pioneering. We're trying to find our way through this. Um, got some pictures in here uh, of a paddock of sunflowers that I've got in this year for Pure Oil NZ. Um, it was a Phacelia and Barley cover crop. And I have planted it, I've, I've, I've used glyphosate this year to desiccate the crop and then I planted sunflowers in following that. Going forward, I think sunflowers is a crop that could be grown organic with a crimp, crimp roller, in a, or yeah, grown without chemicals with a crimp roller. But the side of that is it's late sowing. So the barley had actually come through, and was had seed set, so I think that's when the crimp roller would actually um, would do its job as opposed to glyphosate. I think with a lot of other crops, our growing window in Canterbury is too short for the crimp roller to work successfully. That's where I'm looking at a glyphosate equivalent, I suppose, with less harm, and that's where I've been working with the sulphate of ammonia. Um, using, so if, what, I'm, what I'm using is a dissolved, a saturated solution at 150 litres to the hectare, I'm getting, I have no photos of it, sorry, but I have good, su reasonable success, I'm just playing with timings now. And I was thinking last night, sulphate ammonia is a no-no in organic fields because of its manufacturing process and its artificial nitrogen. I was, I don't know how contentious it could be, but I reckon you could use it as an intro spraying situation in place of, say, for example, flame weeding, because I guess flame weeding is using LPG to burn between rows as an inter-row system, as where sulphate of ammonia is technically made from LPG. So I wonder if there's a compromise there somewhere. Um, I think it's got definite potential to be, uh, well, it could actually be a game changer, especially for me, I think, um, if I could actually drop drop glyphosate out, I guess in time there could be a market for that. 
glyphosate free crops. Um, there's, but yes, I think it, I think all rolls back round to marketing, and I think, yeah, me getting five hundred dollars a ton for my spray free wheat, it's nice because I'm getting eighty done eighty dollars a ton more than seventy dollars more than a ton than the conventional growers, but it's not it's actually worth a lot more than that. I, I feel, um, yeah, but we're still price takers. So, yeah. Yeah, you mentioned um, your pigment essential oils. Um, how, what others have you actually investigated? I know that personally we've had a lot of success with using geranium uh, for curly leaf on our, just, just on our fruit trees. So I was just wondering what others you've actually investigated. Uh, I have investigated uh, tea tree oils one. Um, so it, it has a similar, similar effect on aphids but I think tea tree also gives you some fungicidal activity. Uh, Seedwood oil I'm playing with at the moment for slope control. Uh, I have used some neem oil. Uh, I've used that back when I was doing carrots. It was very good for keeping carrot rust fly out. I think neem oil in organic circles is here and there at times. Um, though, yeah, because yeah, well, those ones are easy available. Peppermint oil and tea tree oil. Uh, tea tree oil is a wee bit of a problem because of its dangerous goods. Uh, it has a flash point similar to petrol, so if you're importing it out of Australia, it's a dangerous goods. But uh, peppermint oil does a similar job as a as an insecticide. So yeah, and it smells nice. Another question that I have kind of in regards to that same line of thinking, yesterday at the field at Simon's Farm, he was talking about how when he was growing, I think it was turnips, along with his contract, he had X, Y, Z, you know, long list of herbicides and insecticides that he had to apply just to be in line with the contract. And wondering for the wheat that you're growing or any other crops, do they, have a problem with you applying these different essential oils or doing something out of the rule book? Um, and how have you gone against that? Uh, they, they haven't said that I'm not allowed to use them, but I haven't told them I'm using them either. <laughs> so, um, I, yeah, I quite often I'll get a, I'll get a spray recommendation or a, a, advice to say, well, this, yeah, this is a problem at the moment. It might be aphids, it might be something else. You need to put a need to put something on, so I will go and do what I want to do. I will put something on. Um, example of that, uh, last year we had quite a rainy growing season and I had a uh, paddock of peas in. And the rep came in and he, he rang me and he says, oh, have you put a protectant on it? And I knew what he meant was, a, have I put a fungicide on? And I just said, yes, I've put a protectant on. And he said, oh, that's good, that's fine. And the protectant I used was, um, was fish and kelp. And it actually turned out that last year, with it being such a marginal growing season, my I guess the resilience I've built into my system with yeah, care over the years is I actually yielded two ton better than the average on those peas, than the Canterbury average, just due to the marginal growing season. Um, I think that's yeah, okay. and that was technically those peas were spray free. Uh, they went five ton. They yielded five ton. Yes, where the average for that variety was three, three. or three point two or something. Yeah. Mm. Have Have you used stock um, when you cover crops to um, help you with that? Yes, I have. Yeah. So, what sort of results did you get with that? Uh, so, I had four crop, four cover, four identical cover crops this year. I had four paddocks of barley going and following them. One crop, one cover crop was grazed and recovered. One was grazed, and two of them were ungrazed. And I've end result, the two that were ungrazed were a better, better quality crop of barley. And one of those two didn't. One of the two ungrazed ones didn't have a herbicide, and it was actually fungus free. Uh, it didn't need a fungicide as well. So that's put my thinking back into the, is it the herbicides causing the plant to be sick, to get sick, yeah. Have you looked at the sort
soil after using uh, sulfate of ammonia to see what the uh, biological activity is? I mean, the no. Of the <laughs> Not yet. I've only just started this experiment in the last couple of months. Um, the European Union is banning uh, or has banned red line, which is a harvest aid, which is a, I guess it's a powerful salt that actually dehydrates plants. Mm. And I can just see the writing on the wall. So I think sulfate of ammonia could have a place for when that's dropped as well. Yeah. But it's, I'm playing with timings. But yeah, I haven't looked into the soil health side of it as yeah. yet. Um, I know a few people that use sulfate of ammonia to do urea for the fact that it is kinder to the soil than urea, but that's only anecdotal as far as I know. The sulfate of ammonia, uh, sort of 50, 70 years ago, used to be used by greenkeepers to stop the worms from casting in the green. Okay. Well, there you go. So it might not be that beneficial. <laughs> I'm just saying, have a look at it. See yes. What it's doing. Well, valid, valid call. I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about the economics of your business and you know, comparing yourself to a conventional wheat grower, how does your yield differ? Um, what is your cost of production compared to a conventional farmer? And do you need a different, separate, you know, higher price for your product to make a profit? Um, so spray-free wheat this year I had a disaster with, and I think that's due to my lack of nitrogen application at during the digestion of my cover crop. Um, that yielded four tonne, which I'm not very impressed with. It did only cost me two and a half tonne to grow, so I needed two and a half tonne of seed to cover my costs. I think um, if I go back last season, I had a neighbour who grew an 11 tonne conventional crop that had six fungicides high fusarium loading and a lot of screenings as, and my, my spray free crop went six tonne so I was actually just as better off I was, I was actually slightly better off than him dollars and cents wise on what he had spent and I, yeah so, so the answer, yeah short answer is yes it is beneficial yes it is profitable but it's, yeah I think we need to be paid more for the end product because of the risk so this year, this year I only I didn't make much out of it. I made a thousand dollars out of it, which is yeah, not quite enough really. Yeah. Um, so that yeah, it all it comes back to marketing, I think. Yeah, in the, in the long run, and I think that's something that the organics have been really really good at in the years gone by. It's getting a getting a market, getting a. <coughs> And I think it's something that regenerative could perhaps, yeah, get benefit from, and where we can work together. No, Nigel, yeah, I've got a question as regard to, I know you're using Brooks meter. Yes. Um, could you comment on the relationship between Brooks levels, your foliar testing and disease? If you, if you know that, but, but before you do, if I can just while I've got the mic, can I just comment on your comment about um, marketing. Uh, the organic industry is incredibly short of, of feeds, feed wheat, feed barley. Um, the poultry industry is growing, the dairy industry is growing, there's a massive shortage and a lot of that grain is being imported into New Zealand because from organic producers overseas. So there's a real opportunity there if you can know that what you're thinking about um, to start supplying us within the organic sector. And, um, just a huge shortage there. So I guess the first part of marketing is knowing that there's a market available. So that's news to me and that it's great to know. <laughs> it's, it's massive and at the moment the prices are sort of for feed, wheat, um, 7.50 to 8.50 a tonne. Um, so I'm getting 5.10 for my spray free wick. Yeah. So there's a gap there somewhere. But as, as organic farmers we're sort of yielding 5 to 6 tonne to the hectare. Now, some of the guys might be doing better. So our gross margins are, are very similar, but our costs are pretty much non-existent to the point. Yeah. So if you can comment on, your, on that BRICS one, that'd be great. Yeah, so uh, I use BRICS meter as an indicator for plant health. Um, 
this year a wee bit with it. With testing, with leaf testing that I've done in the past, this year I've almost used the bricks meter in place of leaf testing. If a plant is growing well and healthy, the bricks will be high. The bricks level, I think 11 is the magic number. If if I've got a bricks and if my plants are bricksing over 11, I can pretty much say that I don't need a, I'm not going to have a, a an insect attack. Which for me has actually been to, true to the letter. Um, I've, I've, I do have pepper, I do have a nice drum of peppermint oil sitting on my shelf. I've sold more of it than I've used myself because my bricksing has been pretty good and I haven't needed it. Um, I did have a spring fair, spring tail infestation come through and wipe out my first plant in the sunflowers. Um, if I'd known to look for them, perhaps peppermint oil might have stopped it. But yeah, it's. So that's where the bricks is coming into it. So a bricks meter, I think, is a must for every every farm every farm ute or quad bike. I think it's a, a good indicator of where your plants are at. Um, yeah, a num basically a number above ten is good. Um, you will get crashes when the plant is or when there's a storm coming. So if there's a if there is a decent storm coming, you, the plants will actually it looks like they reduce, they pull all their sugars out of their out of the leaves and send them to the roots to hibernate for a, for a few days. And another time they crash is, especially in cereals, is when they go from vegetative to reproductive. And I've found that's my that's my next experiment to do is to try and f buffer that uh, nutrient dip because that's I've found is when rust gets into all my crops. Is that yeah, vegetative to reproductive? It's that the plants just physiology, the physiology of the plant it just can't. Well, I think it's actually using all the nutrients that it's got in its leaves to, to punch its seeds out, and that's when the leaves get rust diseases. Is my opinion. Yeah. On that, on that being. This high, and I felt too too mean pulling it out and stuffing it in my bricks. <laughs> Hi, Nigel. One of your slides showed the wheat grain and the flour and the bread. Can you talk a little bit more about that and with, about your milling and where you're going with that? So that was my paddock to plate. Um, so the the spray free wheat was my spray free wheat. Um, I got a Kenwood cake mixer that I bought my wife for her birthday a few years ago and then found that it can put attachments on it. So I found on eBay that I could buy a um, flour mill, bang it on the end of the cake mixer and away you go. Um, I would love to have a market for for that flour. It's, yeah, I think whole flour is perishable uh, because of the oils and things, but it is very nutrient dense. I guess if the the wheat you grind has no trend in it. Um, so yes, so having a having a market for that would be really, really good. And we did we did pursue with a local local baker uh, in Leaston actually, but demand wasn't there, so it didn't fire. People like white bread. Mm. Now I'm going to answer to some of your questions. The, um, the reason the glyphosate is affecting the nutrient uptake in your plants is the biological pathway in the plants that the glyphosate is targeting is the same biological pathway in your soil biology. So when you are applying glyphosate, you're not just affecting your plant, you're affecting your soil biology's ability to do their job. And that soil biology is delivering your nutrition to your plants. So you've actually kind of shot yourself in the foot by doing that. Yes. Yeah, and, and you say that, and it's that it's biology around the roots that is providing that, that nutrition into your plants. And the other thing about your cover crops, your cover crops, you said you have barley and phacelia, so you don't have any um, nitrogen. You need, if you put a, maybe a nitrogen rich plant oh, on your legumes, there was, there was clover under that crop. Oh, there was clover, yeah. Sorry. And also, we used to say a six week gap between putting your cover crop and applying your plant so that you get that bit sorted. Yeah. 
Yeah. So the, I use glyphosate as a tool. Glyphosate technically is my player, I suppose you would say. Um, yeah, there's that, and that comes back to the discussion: is glyphosate worse than tillage? So that's a whole we can, we can probably talk all day on that one, and probably still just yeah, but heads. But yes, and no, I, I do understand what you're saying. Um, the and the, the microbes are the key to the, are a big key to the um, the healthy plants from the healthy soil. So yes. I have a file of notes on Dr. Don Hubers, who is considered to be a worldwide expert in, in glyphosate, um, that I'm happy to send to people. Just let me know. So it's seven or eight pages of my notes of a full day workshop that he did for a Bill Quinn workshop in the White of Africa probably three or four years ago. But one of the things that really jumped out for me was him indicating that they found when farmers used glyphosate, they, just the manner of operation of glyphosate tends to selectively depress beneficial microbes like the lactobacilli portion, and it viralized, it made more potent the standard Rhizoctonia phytophthora fusarium fungal pathogens. So, it, it, so you, you can, that would, might well correlate with why you saw more fungal infections, you think, as a result of using glyphosate. Um, yeah, I don't, I would love to drop glyphosate. It would be, it is actually a pet project. I would love to drop glyphosate. If I was replacing it with 2,4-D, something like that, I would, you know, <coughs> you're jumping out of the pet and out of the pot into the pan, so there, yeah. Um, Or messengers and their scavengers in their extra organic matter, is there some way we can alter our practices or our harvesting or even our seed product to just honor that diversity and, and make changes that mean so most most the weeds is a problem. Most weeds don't like available calcium and they love high potassium. So we can we can suppress weed growth by manipulating Soil. But at the end of the day, I, I do use glyphosate as a tool. I would love to drop it. I think there's a there's probably a huge research worldwide trying to get you know as much as the um, the status quo is trying to be kept. There is probably a lot of people behind the scenes trying to get rid of it. So trying to find an alternative that's not as harmful. Hey, this has been a fantastic discussion, and there is the, the, the panel a little bit later in the day. Um, I'm going to just, just call a, a, a halt now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nigel. Thank you.